renowned energy expert Daniel Jurgen co-wrote an article in uh, the February issue of Foreign Affairs magazine that caused quite a stir. And another heavyweight, energy heavyweight, Michael Liebrich, who's the former head of Bloomberg NE, New Energy Finance, uh, weighed in with his criticisms. Uh, so this interview is with uh, Michael, and it's an excerpt from a longer interview I did with him on August 21st. What I'm essentially arguing is that we've reached a point in time where, in fact, there's been enormous progress on the transition. And Daniel Jurgen and, and a few others that I critique in the piece, uh, Michael Sembeles to JP Morgan, and actually um, also uh, Tony Blair, former prime minister of the UK, um, they have been, they've essentially said, you know, it's not happening and we need to be pragmatic. And pragmatic for them means, um, well, in the case of Dan Jurgen, it means kind of not really doing the uh, transition at all, just understanding that fossil fuels are just so big and so important and so intractable that we might as well, you know, work around the fact that we're going to have some damage to the planet and the climate. At least that's my interpretation of what he's written. Um, Tony Blair's is very different. It's kind of, you know, let's be pragmatic and do you know, insane numbers of tens of thousands of, of small modular nuclear reactors, or let's do carbon capture and storage and direct air capture. So, you know, she's the opposite of pragmatic. So what I've said is, no, first of all, the transition hasn't failed. It's only failed if you really thought that we were going to halve emissions in, you know, just over a decade between the Paris Climate Agreement and, and the aftermath, the analytical aftermath of that, and 2030, you know, the activists were calling for a 50% reduction in emissions. In other words, a 50% destruction of our existing fossil-based infrastructure. And I'm saying, well, I didn't buy it then and I didn't buy it now. But the fact that that didn't happen doesn't mean that we are not going to you know, eventually see fossil fuels falling away. And so the pragmatic way to have a transition is actually to say, look, first, first things first, let's have the economy grow. Let's have people be prosperous. Let's have people do the things they want to do, because you know what? Number one, they're going to do the, they're going to do them anyway. But number two, if you try and stop them, they're going to get very angry. And we see this, you know, in every country, you know, not least in Canada. So, um, so, so let the economy grow. Just make sure that clean energy always grows faster than energy demand. And you know it's been doing that, but from a very small base. So it's kind of hasn't really, um, it hasn't caused fossil fuels to start dropping. But you know what? It's the the beauty of compound growth. As long as clean energy, all of them, nuclear and renewables and uh, heat and waste and bio, as long as all that lot grows faster than energy demand grows in the economy, then just the law of compounding geometric growth means that fossil fuels will be squeezed off the system. Maybe not as fast as some people would like, but that's thinking like a tortoise. We just every year more clean than demand. And that if you do that, then you'll find fossil fuels will ultimately fall off the system. So that, Michael, that, what, what, you've, what you've given me is essentially the political and policy uh, response to what is already happening and what has happened many times in the last couple hundred years. And that is a new, better, lower cost technology has come up the S-curve, finally passed the inflection point and is beginning to displace the older technology or soon will be. It's competitive with, it's on the X, but it's on the growth part, the hockey stick part of the S-curve. And we should all just Take a you know take a beat and realize that and that we are now in the process of displacing fossil fuels. It's going to happen. Um, if I might just gloss that ever so slightly, I mean I don't I don't disagree at, at, at some level. Um, but you know you've got a great uh, energy historian Peter Terzakian um, in Canada, and um, he is extremely nuanced about these you know energy transitions. There isn't just one transition. It's just it's not like you say, well, you know, it's now cheaper, so it's going to win. So suck it up, fossil fuels, because you're on the long train to oblivion. Because what actually happens is competition is sector by sector, geography by geography, use case by use case. And so we are in a situation where in across a lot of energy, yes, the clean stuff wins. 
but across a bunch of other things, you know, you could say aviation or cement or keeping the lights on when it's not windy and sunny and so on. We're not quite there yet. Um, but, you know, what happens is these bastions fall one after the other. And I have absolutely no doubt that, you know, that they will. But it's not um, it, it's not the big chunks. It's just much more granular than, than you portray. I don't think so, uh, Michael. In fact, we're violently agreeing here. I, I just we just haven't we're getting to some complexities where I would agree with exactly what you argued. And I'm not a fan of Peter Tzerkian, by the way, uh, because That's interesting. He can, he's, he's a much more oil and gas oriented than the your, you know, I'll be a brief explanation of his take would would indicate. And uh, there's a the debate in Canada and I'll we can get into this in more detail further into the interview. The debate in Canada is that there is still decades of runway for oil and gas to grow. They they very much have accepted the OPEC view of the world. There's going to be you know 17 million barrels a day of oil de demand growth out to 2050. Gas will just keep expanding forever. That Terzakian's in that camp, and I violently disagree with that. I I'm okay. with the I'm with the International Energy Agency. Peak oil demand in 2029, peak oil uh, gas demand, LNG demand, probably mid-2030, somewhere in there, and a short plateau and then beginning to decline. And and I Terzakian's not there. And so okay, you so I, and I are more in agreement. Okay, so now I, I need to check in with Peter and, and see what he's because normally, you know, I look, I I think of him as being kind of a historian, not a forecaster. Um, and so if he's been saying things about what's going to happen next, I need to check in with him. Because I agree, you know, I, I think that um you know, anybody who thinks there's going to be oil demand growth, uh, they're just not they're just not tracking what's happening. So internal combustion cars, the production of internal combustion cars peaked in 2016. Right. That's nine years ago. Buses peaked somewhere around 2020. I am trading my book. I put my hand up. I am building a business which is providing HGVs, 40 ton plus truck charging in Europe, cheaper than diesel today without subsidies. Now, the nuance, not every country, not every piece of business, but there's a very simple reason why it works. If you can get the trucks doing enough average miles per year, right? Because you've got an expensive truck because the battery trucks are more expensive, but you've got very cheap fuel and maintenance. So there's a break even if you do enough miles. And as the truck costs come down, that break even comes in. And if the electricity is cheaper, that break the break even distance comes in. So we are using data and analytics. You know, if I was raising money, I'd be saying, oh, it's an AI business, because we're identifying using data which pieces of business you can you can do more cheaper than diesel today. So bottom line, trucks as well, right? We're gonna see peak production of trucks, of, of internal combustion trucks. And then a few years later, you see the peak fleet of trucks. So where is this oil growth going to come from? I mean, there'll be some from plastics or petrochemicals. But, you know, if transport is not the big driver, then we are going to see peak um, peak oil use in, in, uh, you know, in the foreseeable, very, very close foreseeable future. You know, but you can go through it all. Uh, coal, right? Coal. G7, coal is falling off the grid. The UK, 42% coal 12 years ago, 0% coal in power generation now. Um, Europe, it's falling off the grid. Uh, Tr uh, President Trump's first term, he was going to stop the war on coal. Well, coal fell off the grid faster during Trump one than it did during you know the Obama or, or any other administration. So coal is dying in the developed world. China has now hit peak coal. The last 15 months, coal has been declining. And the only reason that China had a little surge of coal was because Russia invaded Ukraine and the gas price went up. So people switched back to coal, right? So coal is is, is peak in at peak in China, falling in the developed world. And you've only got really uh, India and Africa. And guess what? Look at the numbers. They ain't building coal. They ain't building the coal. So where's coal growth going to come from? There isn't going to be any. And then you get to gas, 
where this is the great hope uh, for the oil and gas and the fossil sector, it's going to be gas. But we had the age of gas declared by the International Energy Agency some years ago. And, you know, gas has grown, but, but much less than people thought. Why? Because now wind and solar are cheaper than gas-fired power. And then you say, ah, oh, yeah, but that's rubbish because they're intermittent. What are you going to do in the evening when there's no, when the sun goes down? Well, the answer is you're going to use a battery because batteries beat peakers. So uh, wind and, and uh, solar beat the CCGT, the bulk, just chunks of electricity. And then you add a bit of batteries and it beats the gas peaker. So you are going to use gas for high temperature and for you know d difficult things in industry. But the runway for gas the sides are coming in. It's getting narrower and narrower. Now, it may be very long. It may be decades long. But boy, it starts getting really, really narrow. And that's the future that I think your Canadian um, fossil, your Canadian oil and gas industry, they're just, they're just calling it wrong, to be quite honest.